Thank you, Dr. Kankel. Uh, thank you so much for letting me speak at this Congress. Uh, I've been living up uh, in the Arctic for 27 years. Uh, still live as, as a low-impact lifestyle outside of Ambler. And uh, the only running water we have is the good water of the Ambler River outside of our place. No utility needed. Um, have we seen changes up there? Yes, we have. Um, uh, we have melting permafrost, of course, and um, uh, underbrush is growing, less sea ice, changing hunting patterns. Uh, but because of the changing hunting patterns, I have to say that there is an impact on how we deal with meat and fish. People tend to adapt to uh, things that are changing. And um, um, what has happened is instead of going back and do a lot more drying and, and adapt in that way, people tend to just buy more freezers. Well, if you buy more freezers, your utility bill goes up. So the cost of global warming increases our energy use, and uh, that has become a problem. We have a lot more invasive species also, so end cost of living goes up. But what I want to focus on is this premise. Um, first, I want to say that uh, the energy is at the core of all the challenges we face. It is also the culprit of everything that's happening with the global warming but it could be our salvation if we learn to harness and harvest the energy in a responsible way and take into account the environment. So something is happening. I should go back to that comprehensive. Comprehensive planning can be the basis for creating a sustainable infrastructure for any remote rural community as each community is an independent energy island separated from the rest of urban civilization. Something is happening. Globally, the average temperature, of course, in carbon dioxide levels has been rising, and everybody tends at this point to agree with this. There's many variations of it, but it's happening. This has led to ice depletion around the globe. You've seen some pictures of this before. And this one I really like because it shows the dark purple being the actual pack ice that is consistent, and how, how that darker spot of purple is disappearing more and more. And we have uh, several of our, of our communities that are not threatened by the global warming. Kivalina, you've seen in a few pictures before, only 13 feet above sea level and getting heavily eroded by late fall storms as the ice cover, uh, cover now comes later. Additionally, the permafrost under the community, of, co of course, is also slowly melting. And it's estimated that it, there is a cost of 250 to 400 million to move the community. Cotsby and Deering also are threatened by melting permafrost and rising sea, only seven foot and 14 feet respectively above sea level. And so we have Selawik, you've seen some pictures before, located on what I would call floating tundra. Most of it is permafrost and frozen. We were actually out nearby there and did some uh, drilling. Uh, the nearby community, Norvik, is a little higher above ground. We did some drilling to try to put in a wind turbine and uh, drilled really close to their waste dump area and happened to run into a pingo over 25 feet of ice right under their dump area that one day will melt. And that was a wake up call for the community that their whole waste area is actually sitting on a lake that is going to melt. Um, and so, some background, 1978, we had an energy crisis in our region. Oil peaked at $35 a barrel, equal to about $95 a barrel today. Gasoline went up to $1.69. Anyone here that remember gasoline at $1.69? 90% of our households were on propane for cooking. Uh, there was some rudimentary infrastructure for clean water that was starting to build, some sewer systems and energy plans was made to possibly develop wind, biomass, and hydropower. What happened next? The oil prices fell. Almost everyone forgot about the plans, and, a 20, and in tw for 20 years, no one acted on them. That's the area you see there between 1980 up to about 2003, 2004. 
However, during this time, significant infrastructure was developed and many of our communities got water and sewer system at that time. Also during this time, complete high schools were built in each community. They were functional due to the low cost of fuel and electricity. An all-time low cost of living approximately occurred in 1994. An all-time low cost of living. But by 2003, the oil prices have started to go up. Today, we are over $100 a barrel. As you can see the spot there. I'm sure some of you are following what's happening with the oil. It doesn't seem to change on the global conditions out there. Um, it's steadily, slowly raising. Um, we are 20 years behind the schedule on development of the alternate energy resources in the state compared to other places like Europe. It was during those 20 years when the low oil prices existed that we should have acted. Now we have to fight this uphill battle to develop alternate systems where construction and transportation are totally depending on that same diesel oil for power. In 2008, we had the next energy crisis. Gas and oil price went up to 665. 16% of the households were now using propane for cooking. They had changed to electric stoves and microwaves for cooking. Increasing wood for space heating due to the high cost of stove oil for heating also. And the first wind generators were installed in Kotzebue in 1997 by Kotzebue Electric Association. And they have been continuously building now since then. They were actually a little bit ahead of everybody else and some of the first wind powered systems in Alaska was tested in there in 1997 up in Kotzebue. And every increasing cost of diesel fuel makes all utility services more and more expensive. Our cost of diesel fuel doubles every eight years. That's been an ongoing trend. 2003, around just over $3. 2013, we are now over $8. Some of the communities are up to $11. Here's the current prices. Some gas in oil is now over $10 a gallon, some approaching 11 and electric rates approaching a dollar per kilowatt. Um, rising diesel fuels costs impacts all the electric gas home, heating costs, cost of transportation, equipment, food, infrastructure, water, everything of course, since it is the base of everything that the infrastructure in a small society functions on. Here's the cost of the current water and sewer. They have gone up accordingly in some communities reaching a critical threshold. Even though the cost of water and sewer is equivalently high in other places like Seattle at $153 a month for a big family and San Diego at $150 a month, it has to be understood that the employment and average wage in our communities in the Northwest Arctic is very low compared to the lower 48 states. Since the start of energy conservation in our region up there, started in 2009, the region has declined in energy usage, with the exception of the cold winter of 2012. When Selawik froze up, Norvik also had problem, ha they have an above ground and water system, and they tried to save it by turning on heat tapes on all their systems. It was cold for a long time. That peak you see there in 2012 is due to almost entirely and due to Selowick's try to save their water and sewer system from that freeze up. They're still trying to recover from it. A critical time is approaching for our region. At cost of living increases, the question of whether you have food or heating for your household becomes a daily decision. Also as the utility service because more unreliable people start buying drinking water from the stores. Water is now more expensive per gallon than heating and transportation fuel. Since the cost of living reached an all-time low in 94, the population in Ambler has declined. So this is one that bugs me a lot when I live up there. I go to somebody's house and visit and want some drinking water, and some of them is losing hope that the water they have in their faucets are actually drinkable, and they ask if you want some water, and I said, sure, and then they show you the refrigerator. And you go to the refrigerator, and sure enough, there's gallons of water in there, $12 a gallon, and it's sitting in a refrigerator that's cooling it at a dollar per kilowatt. And then this guy that works the household has to leave his family, 
go and work in a mine or some other place just so that his family can buy water that's imported from Virginia somewhere that is not even regulated by the government to be able to drink the water. Something is very, very wrong with that picture. So here's the decline of population of amblers. Since 94 was the high point of, of um, low cost of living in Ambler. The population has been declining for many reasons, but primarily the high cost of living. So what is a sustainable solution to this? 2008, at the height of the crisis, the regional leadership team in the Northwest Arctic brought together all the Nana region's stakeholders for an energy summit. Two days of discussions collected data and a lot of ideas. And in 2009, the Nana region uh, strategic energy plan was created from the data collected by the summit. It's now in its third revision since 2009, and we're working together with the state to, to try to start integrating this into a statewide plan. Um, I can go back to that one a little more. By June that in 2009, the same year the region came together for, uh, for that first steering committee meeting. And since then we have had steering committee meetings for energy at an average of two, three, three times a year to discuss updates and new energy projects. The strategic energy plan is currently in revision stage and the new 2013 version will be available by stakeholders review by the end of August this year. I'll speed up here a little bit. Renewable energy sources that we are investigating some funded projects. We have smart meters for energy awareness in the households, wind diesel projects, Selawick, Cotsview, and Buckland Deering lately here, LED conversions for lightning to bring down the cost of energy in households, and the Synergy project, which is basically solar arrays for water plants. The Ambler solar array has been saving somewhere between six and 7,000 dollars worth of electricity per year for the water plant to run more effectively. Here is the new Deering solar array. We have sun 24 seven up in the Arctic and of course it's better to make them circular than just pointing them straight south. Up. We have also uh, some hydro development we want to do. We're dreaming about it anyway, but at $145 million for a hydro project in a very small population, it's a long shot and it has never been done in the Arctic before. Interties are being proposed and evaluated at $300,000 a mile. Again, small population, try to unify a region the size of a state. Challenges to develop a regional plan with a vision for the future, sustainability of a project and the community, getting all stakeholders to agree on what to develop and how to get people to participate in the process, finding ways to fund the projects. And lessons learned, make sustained effort, realize that cha challenge changes come slowly with understanding of new ways in operation, realize that the energy plan is dynamic, it needs to be revised as new energy sources of thinking comes along, it will hopefully never be completed. I have that question always, when are we done with the plan? Never. It has to be handed off to the next generation if we're gonna have a future. As you get projects up and running, use them for education and community participations. The most important lesson, that recognize that the most important thing in a healthy community is a functional, sustainable, and affordable water and sewer system. As this planning process proceeds, our hope is that there will be collaboration between regions on some projects, in particular statewide energy development. The combined plans would then form the framework for statewide energy policy that in effect would propose a way for the future energy development in the state of Alaska. What is needed is a clear vision for the future. Do we develop energy resources for the short time profits like what happened with the oil extraction? Or do we develop energy resources that can sustain the state for the foreseeable future and create a cleaner environment for our children. The policy needs to be able to adapt to the changing times, sustainable and comprehensive. We are all still in the same boat, but we need to row in the same direction. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survive, it's the one that's most adaptable to the changes that survives. Thank you. <laughs>